Okay, so now we have the second lecture for today by Anton Alexeyev. Please, Anton. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm starting always with the same slide. So that's our plan or our map of the world. And um, uh, for today, we plan to start in the square we left last time the uh, symplectic or Poisson geometry of moduli spaces. We're gonna to drift towards a more algebraic story uh, of the uh, baker camber hausdorff series. And then uh, if time permits, we want to reach uh, to this uh, Pentagon equation for associateness in the end of the talk. We'll see how it works. Uh, and um, note also that, um, so we, we, at the moment we're still in the easy part. So we'll be continue for uh, the grand majority of, uh, of time of this lecture, or maybe till the end to be in the easy part and maybe towards the end or maybe tomorrow at the last class, uh, we have to go to the hard part as well. And which is of course gonna be difficult and exciting and interesting. And uh, so today we still plan to do some kind of uh, relatively relaxed style. Uh, and then tomorrow, of course, we will have to put things together there. It will be more like a review of results and open problems. Um, all right, so let's go to the place where we are now. So this was answering some, some questions last time. Um, so uh, let me uh, recall a little bit what we are what we are doing. So um, we looked at the KKS Poisson bracket on um, on the Lie algebra GLNC, so the n by n matrices of a C. The corresponding group is um, invertible n by n matrices. Uh, and we were looking at this um, very interesting flat connection. So um, we have n copies of G, and we have this flat connection. And um, we have a Poisson map, which depends on those points, um, on the collection of points Z1, Zn on the complex plane, uh, which goes from G to the power N to the moduli of sigma G, where sigma is the complex plane without, without those points. And we also discussed that we can actually factor it through the quotient by the conjugation of uh, by G. And so this map is actually a local diffeomorphism. And both, both those maps are Poisson. Right. Okay. So let me look a little bit more in detail. So let me revisit this map and let me look a little bit more in detail of uh, how it works. So recall that uh, last time we were also looking at functions, which are compositions of uh, Goldman functions with a map psi, right? So we first apply the map psi, we map those uh, n copies of the Lie algebra to flat connections, and then we apply uh, a Goldman function, which is a trace of a holonomy. So, but now we are thinking of it as a function of those n Lie algebra elements of the residues. So this is the trace of the holonomy along the curve gamma on the surface for the connection A that I wrote, that I wrote above. Right, so this connection. Surely these are very, very complicated functions, but let's try to 
to write down what, what they actually are. So there is a trace. And now I will be using uh, uh, a formula for a holonomial of a connection in terms of multiple integrals. So there will be a sum over k from zero to infinity. And here uh, there will be integrals over simplices based on a segment zero one. Uh, and here I should write Uh, K copies of my connection. And you know, I don't write any differentials because the connection is already one form. So the, uh, the product here is a wedge product. So it's a K form and I integrate it over the K dimensional simplex. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one of the standard expressions for a holonomy of a connection or for a solution of this ordinary differential equation defined by the connection A. Right. So now let's let's write it even a little bit more in detail. So there is this sum over K from zero to infinity. And now write each of the A's, it's a sum of N terms. So I can write, write it as a sum over those indices of axis. And then there will be a trace of some product of letters X, right? And then uh, there will be an integral again of a simplex. Um, DZ of S1. Here it's complicated Z I one, or oh sorry, Z of S one minus Z I one, wedge, other terms like that. So in fact, uh, both the iterated integrals and the traces of axis are very interesting objects. We might revisit the uh, those uh, iterated integrals perhaps tomorrow, but today. At least in the beginning, we'll focus on these things, on, on those traces. So, so these are particular functions on uh, this space, g to the power n, right? Uh, and what is interesting, the Poisson brackets of uh, such functions, they close up. In fact, they form an interesting Lie algebra, those objects. So let me uh, write down the answer. Uh, so that's a very interesting combinatorial Poisson bracket. So I'm uh, now taking one such an element, a product, a trace of a product of uh, K axis. So the indices may repeat, or maybe they're all different, whatever you want. And here another trace of X, J1, dot, dot, dot xjl, and I'm computing the KKS bracket. So you see, it's even much, much simpler than the things that we were looking at before, all those golden brackets. So what is N? Is the dimension of matrices. So there was just a question on the chat. So N is dimension of, um, of matrices. And small n, is the number of copies. So there are, oops, yeah, yeah you're right. Ooh. Yeah, so there is, there is a confusion. So I have the small n for the number of copies of G and uh, the, the number of, uh, uh, of poles. And capital N is the dimension of matrices. Right. So uh, let me first make a drawing. Of course, it doesn't help too much, but I will be, uh, I can think of those traces as circles with letters X, which are placed on the circle. So this, this is just a geometric form, right? And then, well, there is X, I2, and so on. And then I draw another circle, X, J1, 
xj2 and so on. It turns out that the ensemble has a very nice and simple geometric presentation. So you should take a sum over all pairs of indices or all pairs of letters. For instance, here I choose those two letters, which are closest to each other. So, um, and uh, I'm checking whether their labels are the same. So whether I1 is equal to J1, otherwise there is no contribution, otherwise there is zero. And then what we do, we delete those letters and we build a bridge between the two circles. So the circles are oriented. So uh, I preserve the, the, the bridge preserves the orientation. So we get again, two topological circles. Of course, now they are drawn in a little bit funny way. And uh, now here I keep the letters we had with the exception of this uh, XI1. Here we keep all those letters. And we put here this xi1, and we put there this xi1. Plus, plus other terms. So I should take a sum of all pairs. So uh, that's what the KKS bracket is telling me. Um, so two remarks about it. First of all, this whole story is. independent of uh, capital N, which is the metric size. So right, capital N doesn't, doesn't show up anywhere in, uh, in, on the right-hand side. Um, so that's, uh, that's one remark. And the other remark is that in fact, this Poisson bracket or this Lee bracket is graded. So, you know, you have some number of X's in each of the words. Uh, we delete two letters. So those were those XI1 and XJ1. And on the right-hand side, we add one letter. So in total, uh, we delete we delete one letter. So we obtain in that way a graded Poisson bracket or actually uh, restricted to those traces, it's a graded, graded Lie algebra. So let me denote this uh, graded Lie algebra uh, in some way, but maybe first, maybe first let me uh, do the following. So, you know, uh, I promised last time that uh, we'll turn around the perspective. So uh, for now, we were doing some kind of Poisson geometry, Poisson geometry of, uh, um, of KKS brackets, Poisson geometry of uh, the moduli space of flat connections. We established a relation of the moduli of flat connections uh, with golden brackets. Uh, but now I would like to do the following, you see, uh, now I want to think about those symbols X. I was thinking of them as matrices, but now I want just to treat them as abstract generators of some free object. So what is this free object? So let me introduce it. So, and this will be perhaps paragraph three, and it will go on the somewhat cryptic name of free Lie algebras. So the first remark. Um, um, so if I take cohomology classes of those pieces in the flat connection, so one over two pi i dz over z minus z i. In fact, these are generators of uh, H1 sigma, even, even with integer coefficients, if you want. But you can, you can also think with C coefficients. So 
So these are generators of H1. Uh, now recall that in the flat connection, uh, there those one forms their coefficients in, in front of the axis. So let me um, denote in a suggestive way the dual basis of H1 by lattice x1 xn so i want to think about those symbols right for now these are these are just letters just symbols uh i want to think of them as uh, generators of h1 and this h1 let me denote it by h and let me perhaps decide that this will be h1 with c coefficients just to have it as a c vector space right so now I would like to define two uh, rather abstract algebraic gadgets that we will be using. So one of them oops, will be the freely algebra Lie algebra generated by the vector space H. And um, just to make it a little bit less abstract, so what are what are elements there? Elements there are x1, x2, and so on. Uh, Lee brackets of x1, x2, multiple brackets, x1, x2, x3, and so on. I'm not going to torture you with formal definitions. So basically, these are linear combinations of uh, Lie brackets. And uh, the other object I want to, to, to use is the enveloping algebra of, uh, of this freely algebra. This is, in fact, I mean, it sounds very scary, but it's an easier object because it's isomorphic to the tensor algebra. And elements of the tensor algebra are simply words in the alphabet x1, xn. So here again, x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, and so on. So these are linear combinations of uh, just of words in the alphabet x1, x2, xn. Right. Perhaps uh, one more remark. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but sometimes you, you want to consider infinite combinations of elements, either in your Lie algebra or in your associative algebra. So uh, this is called the degree completion. And this is the same as to consider formal infinite series. So one uh, famous example is a BCH. So let me denote the corresponding generators X and Y, because on many occasions, that's how people write it. So this is a log of E to the power X, E to the power Y. Of course, this is written in T, uh, of k x y right so i take a vector space with generators x and y i consider uh i consider the tensor algebra so these are the words in x and y and there it makes sense and famously this is equal to x plus y plus one half bracket of x y plus multi brackets and this is written now in in the freely algebra. So the left-hand side, the log ex ey, it looks like it's a, an element of the tensor algebra, but it turns out that it's an element of the freely algebra. All right, so 
now uh, back to our back to our story. Um, right, we've now uh, defined. Let me denote it. G of sigma. So this is uh, a case span of uh, right. I, I was writing traces, but uh, before for cyclic words. I was writing an absolute, the absolute value notation, right? Uh, so for any k, and uh, the bracket is the kks bracket that that we were discussing before. The kks bracket doesn't know anything about any n for those words. So it's well defined. Now um, the Hitchens theorem of the last time is actually saying the following: the map psi of z. It is mapping the Goldman Lie algebra together with a Goldman bracket uh, to this to this gadget with the KKS bracket and this is a Lee homomorphism. So that's uh, that's just retelling the same story, but in some kind of uh, algebraic language. So um, in fact, this is an instance of the so-called Barnaton expansion theorem. So let me give you a couple of uh, definitions to uh, illustrate it. So, uh, but uh, the idea behind it is as follows. So you, you have some kind of filtered object. In our case, the Goldman Lie algebra. I will now explain you a little bit uh, about the filtration. And then you take an associated graded object. In our case, it will be uh, this uh, small g of sigma, something that we produced from KKS, and this is a graded object. And expansions are isomorphisms between uh, filtered and graded objects. So sounds a little bit abstract. Uh, Goldman bracket. So, so there is uh, so there is um, uh, so there is a question on the chart. So the Goldman bracket is on this capital uh, G of sigma, right? So that's the bracket on uh, uh, on the linear span of uh, conjugacy classes in pi one, or on uh, um, on the quotient of the uh, um, group ring by commutators. So that's where the Goldman bracket is, right? So there is a capital G of sigma and a small G of sigma. Does it answer the question? Right. So back to um, Barnard-Town expansion theory. So let me uh, let me recall that um, uh, the group, uh, the fundamental group, uh, it carries uh, um, uh, this. Uh, uh, co-unit or augmentation map. And on each generator, it is si simply equal to one. So now um, um, let's denote by J, the kernel of epsilon mapping K pi to K. So typical elements here would be uh, say comma one minus comma two, the difference of two elements, or more particularly, perhaps what people 
often do, they take a difference of some element in the group unit. So these are typically elements in J. Now you can organize the filtration. of the group ring by powers of this ideal. So this is called the augmentation ideal, this kernel. Um, I should write it. Right, so, so this induces the filtration on K pi. And um, then we get a filtration, this filtration descends to a filtration on Goldman, on the Goldman space. Um, so here is a fact. Once you have a filtration, you can consider the associated grade, right? So the associated graded, Let's say, K, okay, this will be not. So this will be, uh, for each K, you would get a vector space, and then you can assemble them. You, you can take a, a direct sum of those vector spaces. Then in this way, you get associated graded vector space. And you can see what happens with the structures. For instance, with the uh, with the Poisson bracket, or uh, sorry, with the Lie bracket. And it turns out, so the fact is that the graded of the associated graded of G of sigma is isomorphic to small G of sigma. And uh, the uh, uh, graded graded of the Goldman bracket is equal to what we call the KKS bracket. So you know when we were talking yesterday about Poisson geometry, it looked like uh, the Hitchin theorem. It 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 looked like a little bit like an accident, right? So I cho chose some very particular form of connections. I chose, right? I didn't explain why I chose uh, the KKS bracket on residues. Of course, that's the most natural thing which comes to mind. But now we, we start seeing that there is some kind of design in it. So in fact, uh, this uh, small G of Sigma, that's not a random object. Once you know that there is a filtration uh, on the uh, Goldman Lie algebra, then this small g of sigma, it comes, uh, it comes naturally. All right, so what's the interpretation of uh, this Hitchin map? For that, let me tell you a couple of more words about the Barnatan uh, expansion theorem. So um, a definition, of course, here, I very much restrict my attention to, to the story of surfaces. So, right, theta, a map from k pi to th. So I recall that pi is the fundamental group of our surface, it's a free group, and h is the first homology of the same surface. Right, so uh, such a map is an expansion. If uh, the following conditions hold true. So um, theta is an algebra morphism. And so that's the first condition. And the second condition, um, theta of some group element gamma is equal to one plus the homology class of gamma plus 
uh, high degree terms in the Kenzie algebra. So I symbolically use the, I'm kind of uh, uh, using the analyst's notation, so it would be degrees two and higher. So uh, maybe uh, maybe just uh, just an example. Suppose uh, suppose that our pi, as it is in our example, is a free group with generators gamma one, gamma n, and uh, for instance, we can just define theta on those generators gamma i by the formula one plus xi. So xi is the homology class of gamma i. And then it's easy, easy to see that if we extend uh, this map uh, as an algebra morphism, then the second property will be verified. And this is called the Magnus expansion. Now the definition continues. So theta is a group like expansion. If in addition, if in addition, let me put it this way, theta of gamma is group-like in TH for all gamma in pi. And uh, what does it mean group-like in TH? So let me recall that TH has a co-product which looks like this on generators. And, and then we require that delta of theta of gamma is equal to theta of gamma times the theta of gamma. So in other words, uh, uh, it becomes a map of, uh, um, uh, so it restricts to a map of Hopf algebras. And finally, the last piece of a definition, theta is a Goldman expansion. If it induces, if it induces a Lie algebra morphism, So, um, right. So you know, um, in principle, now, kind of, we, we we got a framework. We have a Lie algebra. This Lie algebra is filtered. It has an associated graded, which is a graded Lie algebra, with a Lie bracket of degree minus one because we kill one letter. Now uh, we can ask a question. Is the original Lie bracket isomorphic to the graded one? To be honest, it sounds highly unlikely because if you choose any expansion which identifies for you the Lie algebra with its associated graded, uh, you expect the uh, Lie bracket of, uh, of the original algebra surely the, uh, the main term or the lowest degree term will be the associated graded of the Lie bracket. But then there will be many, many correction terms. So, uh, so in principle, you would expect something like this. So we expect something like this. So Goldman. And now I apply theta to it. So it becomes uh, a bracket on the associated graded and we expect it to be KKS plus, so this here, the degree, degree is equal to minus one, but then normally we expect 
possibly an infinite number of terms of higher degrees. Uh, now the Hitchin theorem tells us that if you use this magic psi, then all those all those higher degree terms they are not there. So that's something very special about the uh, uh, about the Hitchin story. Okay, can we better understand it? And here I would like to show you uh, a rather surprising theorem. So uh, perhaps just to simplify our story, let's say um, we'll, we'll be looking at n equal two, which means that our surface, so there are only two punctures, or if you think topologically, so that's our surface, that's a pair of pens or a sphere with three holes, right? That's one of our basic examples. And uh, maybe I make a somewhat symbolic drawing. So this is gamma one, gamma two. These are two generators of pi one. So pi is a free group with two generators. And um, their homology classes they're called x1 and x2. So um, theorem, I will first give you a formulation and then I'll try to reasonably adequately explain the credits. So the theorem says the following, theta is a Goldman expansion, uh, if and only if. So it's a Goldman expansion, if and only if. The following conditions hold true. Um, theta of gamma one is a conjugate, I will comment on it. What is a conjugate of the exponential of X one? Um, theta of uh, gamma two, you can guess, right? It's a conjugate of the exponential of X two. And one more condition, theta of, let's denote it by gamma naught, the product of gamma one and gamma two. So that's actually the big boundary loop. So this is conjugate to exponential of x1 plus x2. Uh, now about this conjugacy. So uh, conjugate means the following. So, um, so we say that a is conjugate to B if uh, A if B is equal to G A G minus one with G some group like element. So something can be exponential of the freely algebra. Um, okay, so now, uh, maybe even before distributing the, before talking about the credits. Uh, so, okay, that's a theorem. Uh, in my mind, um, it's a very surprising and very strong theorem because you see, uh, so uh, we are saying that the, those, the slip brackets, right? So all those extra terms in the lip brackets, these are complicated things, some kind of complicated maps or, or all those vanishing, vanishing terms. So there is some kind of more or less infinite number of conditions involved. And uh, now this theorem is saying that basically you need to check theta on three elements. There are some conditions, but not hugely restrictive conditions imposed on them. And if those conditions are verified, then theta is our, our map. 
Uh, in particular, uh, let's let's see whether psi satisfies those conditions, right? Um, example, so psi uh, this this element psi z, whether it satisfies those conditions. Um, so uh, what is um, what is psi z of gamma one? Well, um, we know what it is, right? It's a holonomy of uh, gamma one a. But gamma one, that's some kind of uh, loop. Let's say that's our surface. That's C. And here there are two points, Z1 and Z2. We decided to choose the base point somewhere, doesn't matter where. And this is our gamma one. But, but of course, we know that the, the holonomy for that connection, it is conjugate uh, to the exponential of the residue, right? That's some kind of uh, elementary observation about differential equations. Actually, the connection is normalized such that it's exactly that way. Uh, similarly, psi z of gamma two is whole gamma two a, and this is conjugate to x x two. Now, what about psi z of gamma naught? So gamma naught is that curve, and normally it picks for you the residue at infinity. But we know that the sum of residues is always zero. So the residue at infinity is minus x1 minus x2. But now we are taking a wrong orientation. So gamma naught is oriented in the wrong way. So that's why it is whole gamma naught A, and it is conjugate to X of X1 plus X2, which is minus residue at infinity. That's because we, we just chose the orientation in such a way. Right, so uh, it's kind of obvious that psi for any positions of Z verifies, uh, uh, verifies those conditions. Okay. Now, um, what about this, uh, this theorem? Uh, it, it has the following story. So um, in one way, uh, so if we verify the equations, then we get uh, a, a morphism of Goldman brackets. So this is due to Masio to arrive. And Kawazumi Kuno. And I also must say I formulated for a sphere with three holes, but actually it works for surfaces of arbitrary genus with arbitrary number of marked points. And now in the other direction, this is relatively recent, and this is uh, Kawazumi Kuno uh, Neff and myself. Uh, and maybe, maybe a short comment about this, um, uh, about this, uh, uh, this second statement. It actually follows uh, from the following, um, I think maybe a bit surprising or maybe not so surprising observation. Uh, suppose you have two elements in the Frehley algebra. Let's say freely algebra with those generators uh, x1, x2, but the number of generators doesn't play a major role. And suppose you know the following. So A is equal to A1, x1 plus A2, x2 plus O uh, of uh, H square. And uh, a1, A2, they are not equal to zero at the same time. So you have some linear part which is non-vanishing. And then you also know the following, that um, A to the N 
and then you take a cyclic cyclic word is equal to b to the n for all n. So then it turns out that b is conjugate to a. Um, I mean, how should one think about it? Is it surprising or is it not surprising? Let's go back to our uh, first year linear algebra course. Suppose you're given two n by n matrices, let's say complex matrices. And um, so maybe even I, I write it. So compared to the following problem, so A and B are two complex matrices. And you know that the trace A to the N is equal to the trace of B to the N for all N. Uh, does it mean that A and B are conjugate? Not really, right? Your uh, linear algebra course will tell you that there are Jordan forms and you, you're not gonna see them in those traces. So uh, in this kind of abstract non-commutative uh, geometry uh, or non-commutative algebra, there are no Jordan forms. So kind of that's, that's, that's what I think that's what it's saying. So here it does not, it does not follow that A is, that B is conjugate to A. Okay, uh, perfect. So now um, uh, let me, so, so, so um, uh, for the last, for the last few minutes, so let me again orient, so let me orient ourselves in, oops, on this picture. So uh, we passed from geometry to some kind of rather abstract algebra. Um, and now we'll try to make a jump to the associated theory. Um, I'm not sure whether it will work for today, but at least what we want to do, we want to explain this word easy, right? There was this mysterious word easy and uh, let me try to explain that. So um, I also promised to talk about the Kashivara Vern problem. And I will be talking today about the easy part of Kashivara Vern. So easy. Kashivara Vern. So in fact, or sometimes it is called KV1. So this is a problem which is uh, for us motivated uh, by this theorem of uh, Masio Drive and Kawazumi Kuno. And this uh, easy Kashivara Verne problem is uh, saying the following. Um, find F, an automorphism of the freely algebra. Normally I should denote the generators by X and Y, but if uh, by X1 and X2, but if you allow me, I will denote them by X and Y because I'm so used to it. So X is former X1 and Y is former X2. Um, such that, such that what? Um, you can guess, right? F of X, is conjugate to X, F of Y is conjugate to Y, and F of uh, BCH of XY. So that's what used to be the product of gamma one and gamma two is equal to X plus Y. It is somewhat more convenient to, to put here an equality instead of conjugation, because you know, if all three things are conjugate, you can unconjugate one of them and then the, the other two remain conjugate. So here, in fact, we don't lose any generality. 
Right, so this KV1 is a question about freely algebras and about the properties of the BCH, BCH series. And basically solving this problem is finding those uh, isomorphisms between uh, the Goldman uh, Lie algebra for the pair of pens and the corresponding associated variables. So that's our language now. Um, I will probably end uh, today's, today's class, today's lecture uh, with the following proposition. So this is due to Kashavar and Bern in their famous 78 paper. And actually, among many other things in that paper, they figured out that this problem is really easy to solve. So at least at first, right, it doesn't look like it. I mean, it's some kind of non-linear problem about automorphism, so a freely algebra, who knows? Maybe it is trivial, but maybe it's very difficult, right? You, you can't say like that. So, and what they proved is the following, that KV1 is equivalent to the following question. There are two Lie series in variables X and Y such that the following equation holds true, x plus y minus log ey ex, sorry, and the right-hand side gonna be frightening, is equal to one minus exponential minus a joint x, acting on a plus exponential for joint y minus one, acting on b. Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't know whether you are still with me, but uh, if yes, maybe at this point you, you can say, well, I mean, what is it good for, right? I mean, yes, you, you traded some properties which looked at least uh, at first sight uh, reasonable. Okay, thank you for being reassuring uh, uh, on the chat. So, so, so the, this, uh, this KV1, uh, we don't know whether it's easy or difficult, but at least it looks natural and reasonable. Uh, now, <laughs> this uh, kashivara verne proposition saying that it's equivalent to that equation, that equation, it simply looks scary and meaningless, right, at first sight. However, let me already say, um, so this equation is a linear equation, right? And it is really easy to solve. So why is that? Let me rewrite the right-hand side like this. Sorry. Um, oh, and y, y, b. Right, the, this is just a formality. I, I just uh, singled out the Lie bracket with X because in any event, one minus a joint minus X, it starts with a joint of X and then it has higher powers of a joint X. So one joint X, I can always evacuate, apply it to, to, to A, the similar thing with B. Now, uh, tell me, is it obvious that this equation admits many solutions? Um, I think it should be obvious at this point, but let me let me comment on it. So the left hand side, what is it? So it is x plus y minus the Campbell Hausdorff series. In fact, the linear terms cancel out. So it will start with one half of x y plus some multi brackets. And so we are, we are asked to, to do the following. Uh, so we want to represent the left-hand side as a right-hand side. The right-hand side is a linear combination of two terms. So uh, the first term 
is a bracket of uh, x with something, right? And uh, so, sorry, the, the first term is a bracket of x with something. And the second term is a bracket of uh, y with something, right? So you can also rewrite it if you want in this way, right? X. Right, since those joints commute. And those operators, exponential minus a joint X or a joint X and the same for Y, they are simply invertible, right? So in fact, it's sufficient to split the left-hand side as a sum of a bracket with X and a bracket with Y. And the left-hand side has no linear terms. So everything there is a bracket with X or a bracket with Y. So there are many, many ways to, to split it into bracket of X with something and bracket of Y with something. So uh, this presentation gives you many solutions. So um, you see, it, it, it kind of looks a bit funny, right? First, we saw that the Hitchens theorem was a miracle. Because, right, I mean, why, why on earth should, uh, should, should this thing uh, work, right? But then there was some miraculous calculation and it worked. But now we learned that actually many, many things, many, many maps would work. And, and the only thing you need to satisfy is this KV1. And KV1 turns out to be really trivial. So um, perhaps I don't have time. Yeah, I had one more fun topic. I wanted to jump to associators, but uh, I'll do it next time in the beginning of the class. And also I would explain why Hitchens uh, theorem is still a miracle. So I still believe it's a miracle. Uh, and um, after that, I will, uh, I will uh, align uh, as many problems as I can in the Barnaton um, expansion uh, formalism. And uh, for now, we already see uh, this relation between uh, the KV1 problem. The KV1 problem is more or less equivalent to the, uh, um, to the isomorphism between Goldman Lee algebra and its associated graded. So we already see, uh, we already see this link. Uh, now, uh, tomorrow we're gonna see more links, probably uh, this one, this one, this one, and that one. Of course, some of them I would have to formulate rather briefly, but at least we'll, we'll see that now some of the details and then the overall picture. So we'll, we'll see in some way. Uh, I think probably, probably I stop here because uh, yeah, of course there is always temptation to, to say more, but we should postpone till tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Uh, other questions or remarks? Okay, so if there are no questions, see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Prepare more questions for tomorrow.